welcome to Everything Hollywood, another wonderful podcast with my friend Larry Neymar. Hello, Larry. Hey, we made it another week. Yes. Um, you know, not only is the show still going, but we're alive. We haven't gotten um, COVID, whatever the latest one is. The Delta is going to the Gammas, whatever. That is and, crazy. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I got used to wearing my mask again, and yeah, it's okay. Are you still, have you done any, um, have you gone to any events since this whole Delta thing? <coughs> or I know you went to some outdoor sporting events, but that was a little while ago. Um, yeah, well, I, I went to the Dodger game and you had, a, you had a mask up for the Dodger game, which was fine. Uh, now you don't have to wear a mask, but they may put it back, but I'm still going to Dodger games. I've gone, um, I went to a movie, first time since in a year and a half or whatever. Um, I went to a book signing party last night, um, but they did make sure that everybody had to have be vaccinated uh, in order to get into the party and stuff like that. So staying relatively safe, but starting to get out into the world a little bit more. So now I think in California they're changing the laws, right? So basically what they're saying is you have to have a vaccine passport. I mean, I, I don't think it's the law yet, but I think they're changing it like in New York, right? Where when you go to an indoor, even to go to a gym, to a restaurant, you have to show proof of vaccination. Proof, proof of vaccine. And then it's actually, if it's a private business, they have the right to, to insist that you wear a mask. Oh, really? Yeah. So. I know, you know, I know a lot of the state employees, county employees in Los Angeles, now it's mandatory for them to be vaccinated or submit to a weekly, I don't know if it's week. I think it's a weekly, weekly COVID yeah. test. I think, you know, we got to get rid of this thing and we got to just do whatever it's needed to get it behind us. And that requires getting everybody vaccinated and wearing masks in between, getting the kids back to school and stuff like that. And if we need to do boosters, we should do boosters. But just make an effort to say okay no more fooling around we're getting rid of this thing once and for all and be done i know you mentioned that some of the events that you were going to do as far as business was canceled or moved back is that this is just happening now right yeah like a lot of the agencies and the big law firms that are all involved in the um, media and entertainment business were all planning you know kind of mid-august uh returning to work have people right. go back to the office. Clearly, that's changed now. Everyone that I spoke to is definitely not opening in August. They will possibly open in September, but most of them are saying earliest is going to be October. And there are even some, like I know, you know, people who work for CBS that were told that they're going to work virtual till the end of the year. So it's um, it's wrecking havoc on on scheduling productions and all of that stuff. Speaking of uh, CBS, I was reading something about uh, Jeopardy. Is that that's CBS, right? Yeah. About the new uh, hosts of Jeopardy. A lot of lot of controversy. That? I mean, it's it's such a a plum job. Yeah. That you know it's um, you know an, an incredibly visible and uh, a high profile job, and there were so many people that were going after. So what happened? The guy who's the executive producer gives himself the job. I mean, and he, he's a white guy, you yeah. know, and LeVar Burton, who's done, an, I thought, did an amazing job, you know, hosting a uh, few times. He was not even in the running. So, uh, I mean, is that set? They've announced it? This is it? They've, they've announced it. And, you know, from, I mean, first of all, let me say that, yes, some white guys have to work <laughs> sometimes, um, <laughs> you know. I mean, we need to be diverse and all of that stuff, but we need to be diverse. And um, but from what I understand, I'm not a big fan of the show, and I don't watch it regularly. But I understand the guy is great and done amazing. I mean, people I know think that he actually deserved to be the host. Yeah, but what they're saying is, what does he bring? You know, he doesn't have a following. He's not somebody who's done, you know, uh, been a talk show host before. You know, but he was on and he did well and the audience received them well. And, you know, look, CBS and these companies, they don't just make random decisions there. They must have tested the heck out of it and found that long term 
he's the most capable of building a new audience for that show. Yeah, but I think I think that the thing that kind of gets a lot of people is the fact that he was one of the guys selecting the person for the job, and he selected himself. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's what it is, right? Well, that's but also, you know, on the other hand, if it fails and it wasn't the smartest decision, who did he hurt? Right. He hurt himself as one of the owners of that show. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some other stuff that is going on in Hollywood, and I know we touched on it before, is this situation with Scarlett Johansson and Disney, you know, and, and now, you know, it's, it's complicating the matter, Emma Stone is jumping in as well, so what are you hearing about that? Yeah, that, I mean, the whole issue is accelerating, and, you know, for those who haven't watched, you know, one of the last shows, it really revolves around, you know, actors or actresses making movies for theatrical release, and having their their back end, their their bonuses and commissions and royalties based on how much money this thing makes out in the theater. But what's happened is some of it COVID related, but then some of it is just inevitable. Uh, particularly Disney decided they were going to release some of these things on their digital platforms on a pay basis. Mm -hmm. So you could watch, you know, things like Black Widow simultaneous when it's in the theater. But in Scarlett Johansson's contract, she doesn't get any credit for that. So all the dollars there go to Disney, where if you went to the theater, most of the dollars would go to Disney, but some of the dollars would have gone to Scarlett. So it's become a big issue because everybody now sees that it's very viable to release stuff on digital platforms and theatrical simultaneously. Um, so now uh, Emma Stone jumped in because the same issue with Cruella, um, where people who watched it on TV and paid, uh, she's not getting any you know, part of that money, where if you went to the theater and saw it, she does get part. And then more and more actors are jumping on that. Even the agency heads now have kind of come out, I think it was the heads of CAA, came out in support of Scarlett Johansson and you know, and then you look at, you know, another studio, you look at Warner Brothers, yeah, which has actually been preemptive in that, and what they've done is, even though they've released some stuff the same way, they've made deals with the actors to compensate the actors for that, which is the right, is really, you know, my opinion, the right thing to do. Uh, I think Disney took advantage of a loophole. Uh, the lawyers for Scarlet and stuff should have been smarter and realized that, you know, simultaneous releases were going to happen sooner or later anyway, and they didn't protect their client well enough, my opinion. Well, I'm, I'm still, you know, honestly, Larry, I'm still kind of confused for the fact that a company like Disney would not work this out behind the scenes before they did, because they knew that something like this will prompt controversy, right? I mean, it's, it's just, you know, like what you mentioned Warner Brothers. I mean, they made the deal you know, behind the scenes with Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot, yep. you know, before, you know, everything came out. So when it came out on their streaming platform on HBO Max, there's no problems. No problems. Right? Ah. So now here, I, I just don't understand the the thinking behind a studio like Disney. Yeah, and, and it's surprising because, you know, to see that the one studio who did it wrong, <laughs> in my opinion, did it wrong is Disney. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, my feeling, and again, very personal, in the Bob Iger days at Disney, they were much more um, astute and in tune with, you know, the mood of of the world, of the audiences and stuff. I don't think you would have seen it hit the fan like this. Um, now it's just, you know, it's a battle of egos, you know, between the, the talent and, and the Disney family. Disney, Mar you know, Marvel being the same. And, um, you know, quite honestly, Disney, they may win some money. They may get to keep a little more money, but they lose a lot of that good feeling that people have always had about Disney. Now, I agree. I agree. It is, but isn't it Bob Iger still involved? Isn't he the head? No, no more. It, it come, you know, he's kind of stepped down and um, he's not running the company. So it doesn't have his imprint on it. The, you know, the day-to-day the -day doesn't have his imprint on it the way that it used to. Yeah, very interesting. I just, you know, 
it would be interesting to see how this thing unfolds because this is ongoing and it, it, it looks like it's escalating as opposed to, you know, when it first came out, I thought immediately Disney will go and settle this thing and try to squash it, but I, it looks like it keeps going. So it would be yeah. very interesting to see what happens. You know, I think you, you've got a few cases where this has happened where the contracts weren't prepared for this yeah. to happen. But, you know, I guarantee you now every talent contract that gets written um, is going to anticipate this kind of situation and is going to deal with it in the contract. So when you and I are cast in a major film, I think we should really think about this, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And we have to put it in our contracts. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, we'll be right back after these commercials. The reason why I created Hair Dope is because hair colors are popping everywhere. A lot of people, your favorite rappers, your favorite singers, your favorite artists, whoever, they're dyeing their hair, they're doing things like that, and this is a world full of color. So I feel like I want to feel like everyone can express themselves through my color. <laughs> Well, to me, the importance of entrepreneurship is having a career that's longevity. You know, a lot of people jump into the game and into careers of being an entrepreneur and not having longevity in what they're doing. So that's what I really feel like. You have to put your all into it. It has to be from the heart. You have to have longevity. You have to be able to, to stay in and stay active. Welcome back to the podcast. You know, it's been very interesting because a huge announcement from Netflix came out that the new um, show Avatar, uh, they have a brand new cast. And I don't know, Larry, if you heard about it, but this was a huge announcement from Netflix, the fact that they're able to do the show, right? Yeah, well, I mean, first, I mean, let's, let's make it clear that this Avatar is not the avatar in the movie with the blue people wait that's not the same as the this is based on um a show that was uh, actually done as a feature and then a cartoon out uh, which is called the last airbender avatar the I've last seen airbender that, that film. which done amazingly amazingly yeah the, the cartoons did incredibly well so now it's going to go to a live action tv show on netflix how is netflix getting all these incredible deals i mean is it the money or is it how are they doing it well it's it's a combination of things i mean right now creative people are really really happy with netflix because netflix has really shown themselves to let creative people be creative and do what they do best mm -hmm. they've taken a lot of chances it's not like going into the studios in the old days where you know you'd have a film and you know, be about an 80-year-old woman, and they say, we love this film, we want to do it, but can we change that character to a 20-year-old yeah. man? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so creative folks all around town really, really like Netflix, and, and Amazon is getting there. Um, because they're given a lot of freedom, they're given pretty good budgets to do stuff in, and so this um, very, very much anticipated show is coming out, and they've cast it. But I have to admit that some of the names are so hard that I actually had to write, th write them down. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do you know so but the cast? I know, because that cast was just announced. So Yeah, so again, I have to read it because some of them are really tough. So Gordon Comier is going to play Aang. Uh, Kawentio, um is going to be Katara. Ian Owsley is Sokka. And uh, Dallas Liu is Zuko. Well, that was quite a bit of pretty good cast Larry yeah they do they have a good cast no question yeah I mean Netflix I think right now they can get any show they want right I mean it's it, they've been they've been amazing at acquiring so many amazing amazing shows and I think a lot of these you know creators want to go to them because it's more of a creator friendly yeah place right yeah it, it is it's it's kind of now even with me you know that's the first place I think of yeah when I have a new project well, let's look at the trailer for this wonderful show and we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Water. Earth. Fire. Air. We're all fans 
hands of something or someone. Investing our time and loyalty, but getting little in return. Well, it's about to change forever with Fanvestor, a platform that lets you get in on celebrity businesses early on, buy shares of their new startups, support a charity and new product drops, and share once in a lifetime experiences with them. What's up, it's Amari Stoudemire here, and we're launching Masa with Fanvestor to offer a limited edition, perks, products, and experience to my fans. Here's how it works. Go to fanvestor.com. Choose an opportunity you want to get in on. Click here and there, and you're done. Go check your email for the investor's certificate. And don't forget to check back often for updates on your new business investment. It's official now. Celebrate your support with an experience. Go 10 rounds in the gym with Amare. Get a matching tattoo with Super Dope Q. Or get on FaceTime and hang out by the pool with DJ Khaled. After all, you're more than a fan now. You're a fan bester. Welcome back to the podcast. Larry, I want to say that I'm so impressed and really happy how people responded to our Maryland Week shows. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty amazing. <laughs> we got, um, I think it's it's by far the, the highest rated uh, shows that we've done. And it just shows that the interest in Maryland is, um, you know, stayed strong for, I mean, 59 years since she's dead. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, it's stayed incredibly strong. And we had uh, a lot of people watching all those episodes and stuff. We got a lot of feedback and it was good. And we actually even have today um, somebody who wrote a book, a new book that's coming out. Yeah. And it's called uh, John E. Marilyn, yeah. which m means John and Marilyn. And it's about Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe and it's got some unusual insights. And it's written by um, an Italian fellow named Giovanni, I gotta make sure I get this right, Manacochi, yeah. Giovanni Manacochi wrote the book, and um, he's uh, he did an interview with us, which we actually yeah. recorded and stuff like that. And I think we're going to go and play the interview right now. Yeah, that was really good. I had the pleasure of interviewing him, and and he's just a, a very knowledgeable and really fun guy to you know to speak with. Of course, I don't really understand Italian that much, but uh, a little bit. I got some words, but. You guys check it out and hope you enjoy it. Really impressed by your book and by everything that you're doing. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And I, I know you're also a journalist, but tell me how you became a journalist and also then uh, you became a writer as well. Um, io ho iniziato come eh, sceneggiatore e ho studiato e collaborato con eh, Bernardino Zapponi, eh, sceneggiatore di Federico Fellini. Eh, poi mi sono dedicato al giornalismo web, eh, con un mio collaboratore ho fondato un giornale online, eh, mauxa.com, e il romanzo John e Marilyn eh, è nato come sceneggiatura per un film. Ok. Wow. Um, what do you think um, are the most important elements of good writing? Penso che siano uh, la formazione e l'esperienza. La formazione è necessaria perché eh, così non si rischia di scrivere eh, cose che eh, sono già state scritte. Eh, invece l'esperienza è necessaria per eh, non fare eh, errori scrivendo delle cose nuove. So now let's talk about your book. What inspired you to write La Fragilita degli Dei? I hope I'm saying it right in Italian. <laughs> Uh, sì, ehm, l'idea del romanzo John e Marilyn nella fragilità degli dei è nata eh, anni fa mentre stavo studiando il periodo di John Kennedy. E, ehm, ho visto una foto di Marilyn Monroe in una rivista e 
le due immagini si sono oh, sovrapposte e da lì è nata uh, la storia. Ok. Uh, how much uh, research did you have to do for the book? Eh, questo è stato l'aspetto più complesso da affrontare. Eh, ho dovuto eh, combinare la finzione con dei dettagli assolutamente eh, precisi eh, sui vari eventi storici per restituire diciamo, al, ai lettori il colore eh, con cui si erano svolti. Eh, ho studiato i documenti della CIA, eh, dell'FBI, e anche interni eh, alla Casa Bianca. E, 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 in eh, biblioteca ho poi analizzato i, i, Roma, i giornali che appunto eh, nell'epoca raccontavano i due personaggi, John Kennedy e Marilyn Monroe. And how long did it take you to write the book? Per eh, scrivere la trama eh, ho impiegato un anno. Per scrivere il romanzo eh, un anno e mezzo, ma in quel tempo diciamo ho anche fatto altre cose. That's amazing. People don't realize how long it takes to write a book. I mean, that's a long time. Uh, how many hours a day do you write? Due ore al giorno all'incirca e non di notte comunque. Wow. Um, so let me ask you something, um, you know, as an, as an artist, I know there are certain, you know, as you're writing a piece of music or, or a book, sometimes you run into a, a difficult part where you're kind of struggling. So what part of the book, uh, did you have the hardest time writing? Um, la parte dove si raccontano gli incontri tra Marilyn Monroe e John Kennedy perché eh, secondo alcuni questi incontri non sono mai avvenuti eh, secondo altri sì eh, così ho inventato ma eh, diciamo attenendomi ai fatti well it's Marilyn Monroe's 59th death anniversary um... Do you think she's still an icon? And, and if so, why? Why do you think she's still an icon? Eh, credo che rimarrà un'icona perché, come appare anche nel romanzo, ha saputo proporre l'immagine di una donna disinibita ma eh, intelligente. E poi eh, Marilyn è stata anche la prima donna a contrattare con gli studios, ad esempio per equiparare il salario tra attori uomini e donne. Ad esempio quando recita in eh, eh, Gentleman eh, Prefer Blondes, i produttori eh, le danno un piccolo camerino e lei si ribella e il produttore le dice tu non sei famosa. Ma eh, Marilyn risponde ma il film si chiama Gentleman Prefere Blondes e io sono la bionda. Yeah, and some like it hot. Um, what did you learn through writing this book that you maybe didn't know before writing it about Marilyn? Diciamo che aveva un manager che la controllava molto e, e invece lei era molto ambita dai politici eh, perché eh, poteva spostare molti voti per le elezioni. Interesting. Um, do you think there would be another Marilyn or you think she was very unique for her time? Penso che per quel periodo lei fosse un personaggio eh, unico e il fatto che sia morta così giovane ha amplificato il suo successo, bellezza e morte, quindi due elementi eh, esplosivi. Sì, yeah. yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, you're also a screenwriter. Uh, writing for television. 
how is the writing process different than writing a novel? Beh, per scrivere una sceneggiatura ehm, puoi anche non prenderti cura dei dettagli perché il regista eh, si prende la cura eh, di questo aspetto. E in un romanzo, se non curi i dettagli, tutti ti criticheranno. E qual è il most valuable piece of advice? you've received about, you've been given about writing. Ma posso dire quello che mi ha eh, detto Bernardino Zapponi, appunto lo sceneggiatore di Fellini, quando scrivi metti lacrime e sangue nella storia. Yes. What, uh, what advice, you know, we have a lot of viewers um, on this show that are artists and uh, people that are trying to break into the business. So what advice would you give to a beginner writer? Beh, eh, scrivere quello che si vuole, ma imparare a venderlo bene. And now this this what I like to I want to ask you, what is your favorite book and movie for you? Eh, allora, il mio libro preferito è Macbeth di William Shakespeare. Eh, il mio film preferito è Otto e mezzo di Federico Fellini. Yeah, great, great choices. Well, Giovanni, I, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I, I really uh, love what you've done with the book. Can you tell how people can get your book? We will put it on the description below for people to get it, but people can get it on Amazon, right? On Amazon and on your website, correct? Correct, esatto, sì. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you very soon. Take care. Grazie a voi. Grazie. Welcome back. Um I was reading this about Jennifer Hudson playing um, Aretha Franklin. You know, this just came out in the trades. I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on that casting. I mean, to play somebody who's a legend, yeah. a real legend, right? And that a lot of people have seen her perform, at least, you know, on TV. What do you think? What do you think of Jennifer Hudson being the choice of playing Aretha Franklin? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, Aretha is iconic, and, you know, she's this amazing star that, uh, you know, transcends time. But, you know, quite honestly, I couldn't think of anybody else to play Aretha other than Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. I think it was really, really good smart casting and stuff. And Jennifer Hudson, I think, is perfect yeah. for the part. I think she'll do real well. I and agree. And, and, and she can sing. I mean, she can. And she's doing she, all her own singing, obviously. She's going to do her own singing, as far as I know, and stuff. I think it's good. I'm looking forward to that, because I was a big Aretha fan. And, um, you know, you got that, that thing, which is going to go to theaters. It's being done as a theatrical. I mean, it'll go to the pay services after, I guess. But um, it's, it's looking good. I mean, UA and Universal are both involved. Uh, so it's going to be a, a high-level thing, and it's got high-level high people in it. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I saw, f you know, for the first time, this amazing performance uh, that was recorded on film, actually. Aretha Franklin in 1972, when she was performing in Los Angeles, Amazing Grace. Yep. And that, you know, in the audience, you could see, you could see Mick Jagger. I mean, you could see all these stars that came in to, to, to just be part of that experience. I don't know if you've seen that performance that documentary is uh, i haven't seen that documentary but i've actually seen her live twice well, you have seen in her new live. york yeah, in the 70s um i saw her twice and the shows are just you can't even describe them they're just so amazing and uh you know and, and stuff and exciting and stuff like that i uh, i haven't seen anybody like aretha since aretha yeah i mean she's just she's a one of a kind and i think they did a good job casting I, i really look forward to this one that yeah me too i can't i can't wait for that so larry thank you again for a wonderful show it's always fun to 
to talk to you and to catch up. And um, mm -hmm. I want to thank you guys for watching the show. You know, Larry and I, we read the comments and we appreciate you guys watching the show. And if you guys comment down below, Larry, you and I will... Yeah, we, we answer just about every single one. So. We pretty much answer all of them. And we love to hear from you guys. So thank you again. And we'll see you on the next show. Thank you, Larry. Take care.